Our sermon today is Reflecting Jesus from Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know it well, I'm sure. Let's read along in God's Word. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he went, then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Join me in prayer. Dear precious Father, we do thank you for your word. In your word is life. In your word is wisdom. In your word is knowledge. Knowledge that surpasses our understanding. Father, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds today to what you would have us hear, what you would have us apply to our lives. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've got an exercise for you. I want you to do something for me. Is turn to somebody next to you, in front or behind, and tell them, I love you. Can you do that? There you go. That's nice to hear, isn't it? To be told, I love you. What's better than being told, I love you? being shown we are loved. And that's what Jesus is talking about today. And as I read this again, read it for you today, I really wish I could develop that, that skill Jesus shows here. Because once again, he's being tested by the different, this is an expert in the law. I don't know if we'd call him a lawyer. He could have been a a scribe, a priest, or somebody, but he knew the Mosaic Law is what it's referring to. And they regularly were testing Jesus. And so he, he wanted to see what Jesus said. So we asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? To inherit eternal life before Jesus died on the cross, one had to be perfectly righteous. That meant no sin at all. And that's what they were living then. They were trying to live a life. Some were. Some did better than others. Some didn't care, just like today. But their goal, if they wanted eternal life, was to live a perfect life. And that meant they needed to know the law. They needed a plot. Asking about here. And so Jesus turned that back on him. You're, you're an expert of the law. What do you say? And so he quoted first out of Deuteronomy 6, 5, which is known as the Shema. And it was that, that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And back in Deuteronomy, they were told to tie that and wear it on their forehead or on their wrist. Keep it ever with them. And Orthodox Jews to this day will wear a little box, what's called a phylactery and keep it bound around their head to keep that word of honoring God ever present in their lives. The other passage, Love Thy Neighbor As Thyself, comes out of Leviticus, part of the laws that God gave them in the book of Leviticus. 
And so Jesus says, you responded well. You know the law. You know what to do. And very often we do know what to do. And it's drawn out of us. And so again, Jesus lays it back to him. Do that and you'll live. You know the answers, so just do it. But it says he wanted to justify himself because he knew what he was doing. See, this is the reason. He knew how he was interpreting neighbors. And so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And then here Jesus kind of drives another little needle in or maybe a dagger because he uses a Samaritan to tell the story. Now, Samaritan simply defined as a person who's from Samaria. That's the easy definition. The longer definition is more really bound because the Samaritans were part of that northern that was carried off into exile by Assyria. And Assyria's method whenever they conquered somebody was to take people from that land, preferably the choice people that they saw of that land, take them to Assyria or one of their other conquered kingdoms, and they would take people from that land and bring them back, typically the dregs, because they wanted to get them out of where they were, and plant them in the newly conquered land. And so the Samaritans in this way were a mixed breed. They were mixed blood. They were no longer pure-blooded Jews. And for that reason, the Jews despised them hated them so much that they would not even go through Samaria. They would go out of their way to go across the Jordan, up the west side, and come back in if they needed to go to a town north of Samaria. So Jesus uses someone that they hated to make his point. And then he tells the point that we just read of two religious leaders coming by, a priest and a Levite. They see the man. They not only keep going, they go as far as they can to the other side. And they felt righteous in their actions because they had interpreted the law that to touch him or deal with him or to deal with a dying body was to uh, become unclean. And if they did that, they would have to go through a cleansing ritual. So in ignoring the man and leaving him lying there, one, because he's a Samaritan. Two, because he was wounded and dying. They felt justified in their religion according to the tradition they had established. The Samaritan, we don't know really what he believed. It doesn't tell us. He could have been a, a believer of the Jewish law. He could have followed that in his life. We don't know. But we do know that he stopped and helped the man. He, he tended to his wounds. He did, a, he did triage right there on the spot. But then he didn't say, okay, you'll be all right. I'm going on my way. He mounted him on his donkey, which meant he had to walk. He took the man to an inn, stayed with him through the night, which was partly practical because he didn't need to travel at night, partly to take care of the man. And in the morning, he left funds to care for the man's wounds and promised to be back by on his return trip and pay the innkeeper whatever else he owed him. So then Jesus, after telling this story, puts the question to the expert in the law, who was the one who was the neighbor? And he answered honestly. He was truthful in that. He had to admit it was the one who had mercy. He didn't say the Samaritan, probably on purpose. He said the one who has showed mercy. And Jesus laid it back in his lap. Go and do likewise. I think Jesus passed the test. The man didn't like the answers, but Jesus passed the test, teaching the man about mercy. And that's what Jesus teaches us. John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus talking to his disciples says, A new command I give you, Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And it behooves us to pause and say, okay, how did Jesus love us? Well, Jesus gave his life for us. 
He died on the cross. He bore our sins. He purchased us redemption. And I really think we can go a little crazy by saying that that means all of us ought to die for another. If we did that, there wouldn't be many of us left around. But it, it's more of how Jesus teaches where he takes an idea and he goes deeper with it. He didn't mean the simple answer of taking a bullet for somebody. He meant giving our day-to-day -day life to help each other. Giving up what we want to do so that another could be helped. Giving up what we prefer so that another is blessed. That is, giving up our life for another one. Jesus said, if we do that, he continues, by doing that, everyone will know you are my disciples. That's because other leaders weren't teaching people to do that. They weren't teaching them to lay down their life, to give sacrificially. Jesus taught in another passage, if someone demands their cloak of you, give them two. If they say, go with me a mile, go with them another mile. Go beyond what is asked of you. Jesus teaching this is going beyond the tradition of the Judaic religion at the time, certainly going beyond the common sense of man, which would be to take care of number one, which is me. So Jesus is teaching, think about the other person. In essence, Jesus is saying, it's not about you. And he's saying, when you do that, others will know that you are my disciple, you are my follower by practicing this love one for another. And so that's a clarion call to us today to show love in action. It is certainly pleasant to hear someone say, I love you. It's pleasant in a romantic relationship, but it's also pleasant just from a friend to hear that or to have it said in other words, but to know their love for us. I grew up in a family where the parents weren't particularly expressive. I can honestly say I don't remember hearing I love you from my parents. I didn't doubt it. I didn't resent it. I didn't think I was uh, some outcast or abandoned or anything like that. And in spite of my brothers and sisters, I didn't think I was adopted, though they tried to lay that on me. I knew my mom and dad loved me. I knew they loved me when they treated me special. I knew they loved me when they took the belt to me. They could do that back then. And it didn't, it didn't wound me. Matter of fact, I remember, just a little digress a minute, I remember when I got old enough, I don't know what I'd done, but I'd done something. My mom came after me, and what she could grab handy was a hairbrush. And she took that to the seat of education, and I didn't cry. I could stand the pain. Ooh, you talk about getting mad then. Ended up that hairbrush, ended up with a broken handle. But I, I, I learned, I knew she was disciplining me for my own good, I knew I had done wrong, and I knew that was an act of love. In fact, it's interesting with young people that very often, if they are not getting attention, they will act up so that they get attention, even though they're going to get in trouble, even though they're going to be punished, it's better than being ignored. It's better than feeling like you don't exist. And that's sad, isn't it? That they're not getting positive attention or even disciplinary attention that they know is love to where they act out to say, I'm here, somebody see me. It's, it's, it's a sad situation, but it's a real one. So Jesus teaches us of this need to demonstrate love. But he goes on, there are other lessons there. In Luke 6.32, Jesus is talking about loving others again, and he expands on this. He even starts meddling a little bit, as we like to say. In verse 32, Jesus starts, If you love those who love you, what is that to you? It's easy to be good to people who are good to us, isn't it? It's easy to do favors to those who are 
favorable to us. He says even sinners do that. So you're no better than a sinner by doing that. And if you do good who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Then your reward, but love your enemies, pardon me, love your enemies, do good to them and lend to them without expecting anything back, then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. Because he is, a kind, he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So Jesus, again, is taking this teaching. He's going deeper. That's what he does. You see, they understood showing love to each other. And so within their assemblies, they would do that. If someone was sick in, in, in their sphere of influence, in their assembly, in their circle, they would take them food. They would nurse them. They would help them. They, they already loved them and were friends with them. But... If a man was left lying for dead on the, on the side of the road that they didn't know, didn't care about, didn't have any reason to help him, they'd pass on the other side. So Jesus is saying we need to reach out to those we consider our enemies. And enemies can be anybody that's not a friend, not family, not a neighbor. Maybe you've got family that's enemies. That's, that's something for you to deal with. But it means those people who are not already in, in favor with us and us in favor with them. It means people different than ourselves. It means people who have different ways, different ideas. But it, he reminds us the Father is kind to them. He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. He says, be merciful as our Father is merciful. As Christians, we are to reflect Jesus Christ. We are to do the things He did. We are to help those who are downtrodden. I had the opportunity to go to a conference last week. And the, the first speaker, Mark Clifton, was very encouraging. He was talking about small churches that have limited resources. How we can deal with that. And he gave some practical tips and they offered some practical helps. But what really helped is he got down to the point. He said, you've got everything you need to minister to people. Because what people need is hope. What they need is Jesus. A wonderful, beautiful building is great. It's comfortable. We can sit here safe and sound we're not worrying about water dripping on our head and we're not choking from, from mold and mildew. But this building doesn't help anybody unless they hear about Jesus when they come. We have everything we need to help the world around us. We don't need resources of Southeast Christian or Crestwood Baptist or any of those big churches. We need to share Jesus Christ. We do that more than just telling them God loves you. There's a book sometime back that, uh, based on the cartoons by Charles Schultz, Snoopy, Charlie Brown, y'all know all those. The book is The Gospel According to Peanuts. And the author took the cartoons of Charles Schultz and made various points from them. Christian. One of them that has stuck in my head these many years is Linus and Charlie are looking out the window and they see Snoopy on top of his doghouse. You know, Snoopy always liked to lie on top of his doghouse. On this particular night, it was a stormy night like we had recently. Rain is just pouring down on him and nothing's worse than a wet dog, right? When they come in and shake themselves all over you, and that smell, they looked out, poor old Snoopy, out there alone in the rain. We should cheer him up. 
And so they decide, they put on their raincoats, they put on their galoshes, and they go out to Snoopy, and they say, Snoopy, be of good cheer. And then they go back in their dry home, and they don't offer Snoopy a dry place or anything. And too often we can do that as Christians. We can say, God loves you, it'll get better. We can give platitudes, but we don't take time to we don't take time to hear what their particular pain is and just listen. No, most of the time we don't know what to do. Most of the time we can't do anything about their problem. But one thing people miss is someone to listen and care and can at least say, you know, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I'll give you and then lift them up to the Father of Heaven. And if they'll listen, tell them how they can know Him experientially, how they can be forgiven of what they've done, how they can be filled with His presence through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is so much more meaningful than just saying, I'm sorry, it'll get better, and go on our way. If we have the power, the Bible says, if you have the power to do good and don't do it, it is sin. If you can get ill, do that. If you have a code, if you have something that they need, the Bible enjoins us, do, that. do what you can do. But certainly, we need to tell them about Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, while... Social ministry is very important, and we need to do that, and the church needs to lead in doing those social ministries. If we do not include in that the, the word about who we're doing it for, why we're doing it, in, in short of God and Jesus Christ, we have failed. It is like having a man by a lake full of fish, we pull one out, and they're, they're satiated at that moment, but we don't they can feed themselves for the rest of their life. That's what it is when we do a good act, but we don't tell them about Jesus Christ. Jesus is teaching us to care about others. Even if you don't like the way they live, even if you don't like the way they look, to care about them and do what is within your power to do and then to make them a matter of prayer. Jesus pushes us to be active doing that. One other scripture, Luke 14, this is fairly long. But they were sitting around the table with Jesus. One of them heard him talking. And he said to Jesus, he thought he'd jump on the bandwagon. We're good about that. This one said, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. And yeah, that's wonderful. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent a servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for now everything is ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I bought a field. I must go and see it. Kind of dumb to buy a field without seeing it, right? Not a good excuse. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry. You ever thrown a party and nobody came? He ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, and this is, this is the key sentence, go out into the roads and country lanes, compel them to come in. Not just tell them there's a banquet. Compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get to taste my banquet. So, 
The first crowd that he invited, because they refused his invitation, they don't get to take part of the banquet. God is bidding to the whole world to know His Son as Savior and Lord. He's calling to everyone. And many of those out there say, well, God is a God of love. He wouldn't not let us in. But here's one of many occasions where Jesus said, no, you don't accept the invitation. You don't come to the banquet. But all those dregs of society, as these people would consider them, all the outcasts, the lame, the broken, those who in tenderness of heart and spirit heard the word, received it, they're going to be at the banquet in the kingdom of God. And Jesus tells us, go out into the roads and country lanes, compel them to come in. Many of you will remember the song, Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Be to the helpless a helper indeed, unto your mission be true. We are to be a blessing to others. God has blessed us and takes care of us so that we are free to take care of others, to carry the word to others. This word is like every word he has. Jesus said in some other places, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. And he blessed are ye if you do them. And so, our merit as a Christian, our merit before God, our reward from before God is not if we know the law. It's not if we know the Word. It's not if we can quote the verses. It's not if we can sing well or preach well or any of that. It's if we share the Word because God wants His house full. He wants this house full, but that's not the house He's talking about. He wants that house full. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to eternal life. God says, go and compel them. He doesn't say it'll be easy. It won't be easy. Matter of fact, he told his disciples, you'll be rejected. If they rejected me, they'll reject you. In a way that should help us because if they won't receive our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, God's Son, and we're rejected, we're in his camp. We're aligned with him. As a pastor many years ago, you get frustrated as a pastor, as a Christian, trying to share your faith and people don't. I, I, I am in awe of missionaries who go to a field, foreign or domestic, and work for years and never see anybody respond. I just don't know that I'd have that stick to itiveness. But they do. In John 6:66, 6, Jesus is teaching. Many disciples are there. As disciples originally was not just the twelve anybody that followed him. Jesus is teaching on a subject. And 666 tells us, and they said, this teaching is hard. Who can do him no more? And that encouraged me as a pastor because if the Son of God can't convince everybody about the value of his word and living for him, I don't have that hope. You don't either. But you know what? It doesn't excuse us from telling, from living for Christ, from sharing, from going. Our Lord and Master commands it.
Go with me to prayer as Mark comes to lead us in song. Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you for these words of Jesus. Thank you for the mercy of Jesus. Lord, we don't deserve your mercy. You are a just God, and we deserve your justice. But you've shown us mercy by not holding to our account what we are guilty of. Father, you've gone beyond mercy, and you extend to us grace. You give us what we don't deserve. So, Father, thank you that Jesus did that for us. Thank you for his instruction. Thank you for our ongoing forgiveness. Thank you for your patience with us. But forgive us, Lord, when we develop our own law, our own rules, our own way to live for you. Father, help us to hear and obey and to follow you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.